As you know, we're in the midst of a series uh, titled Mythbusters, and in this series, we've taken on some of the common beliefs or, or thoughts or sayings that have crept into the Christian life or the Christian church that often aren't biblical but get passed down from generation to generation or in certain times. And so we've been kind of taking those myths and addressing them to see what does the Bible actually say about them. We've talked about the myth of all dead people go to a better place. Uh, Last week we looked at the myth that faith uh, fixes everything. And today we're going to take on a common myth that all things happen for a good reason. And, and actually take a look at the passage that this is based on and, and what the Bible actually says about these things. So if you have a Bible with you today, today we're going to be in the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we're going to look at one verse in particular in Romans chapter 8, but we'll kind of look at it within the context that it's in, and we'll be addressing this idea that everything happens for a good reason, and the most common verse and one of the more popular verses in the Bible, Romans 8, 28, that it's often based on. Here's what I would like you to take from this passage. If you have a worship guide, you can jot down uh, these two main points, uh, but we're going to walk through the passage, and I'll give you several other things you can add on to it, and in the worship guide as well as a page number for this passage on page 944. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one in the chair in front of you, the black hardcover ones, and page 944 will take you to this passage. But I want to answer three questions today from this passage. Three questions that are really important to understand what this very popular verse is all about. The first is, who is the promise for? Who is the promise for? The second is, what does the promise mean? So who is the promise for? What does the promise mean? And then lastly, how can this promise possibly be true? How can this promise possibly be true. See, we often say it or or repeat it a lot, but we've never given much thought to how it could be true. And we don't think to to see how we honestly wouldn't like the truth of this passage in many other settings in life, uh, but in this setting, we tend to embrace it. So how can it possibly be true? Who is the promise for? What does the promise mean? And how Can it possibly be true? So let's open our Bibles and take a look at this passage. And I'm going to give you two points in your notes, but I'm going to give you several things to jot down or perspectives on how we can properly apply this verse and how we can oftentimes uh, struggle in applying it as well. Romans 8, 28, it'll come up on the screen as well, says this. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So who's the promise for? What does the promise mean? And how can this promise possibly be true? The first one comes right out in this passage for who is the promise for. And this this verse is kind of a sandwich. It's got two truths on either end of it that are really the same, the exact same thing. And then it's got the second promise or the second statement right in the middle of it. So I've highlighted it here. Who is the promise for? The verse says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. And then it repeats that statement in a different way. For those who are called according to his purpose. So twice the Apostle Paul talks about the audience for whom this promise is for. This promise is for those who love God or for those who are called according to his purpose. It's for those who believe in Jesus Christ. It's for his church, God's people. So here's the first statement I want you to understand in applying or thinking about this promise. All things don't work together for good for everyone. All things don't work together for good for everyone. This isn't a generic promise that we just throw out there to every single person that we meet. It's a promise that's designated to a select group of people that God spoke them through through the Apostle Paul. It's for people who are uh, believers in Jesus Christ, who have trusted in Jesus Christ. Now, let me just flesh this out a little bit because we have to ask ourselves, well, what the love of God is not. Some people might say they're in that category or they believe in God or they believe in Jesus Christ or they even go to church on a regular basis, but are they really part of that group? It says, for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say for those who go to church every Sunday. 
It doesn't say for those who pray every so often, even though those things might be manifestations of someone who loves God and is called according to his purpose. So let me just pause to talk a little bit about what the love of God is not. And then we can pause to see what it actually is. Here's a couple things. Loving God is not meeting his needs or doing things for him. Often we think that we love God or we're part of his family because we meet his needs or we're doing things for him. And whenever we relate to God in that kind of way, like God needs something from us or, or we have to do things for God. Oh, that's right. I got church this Sunday. I guess I got to do that for God. I got to do this thing for God. I got to serve God here. He needs me in this spot. When we interact with him in that way, we develop a mindset that God owes us something because of all the things we've done for him. That's not love for God. That doesn't Reveal a love for God because you do things to meet his needs or you do things for him. That's actually manipulation. We don't often admit that, but that's what we're doing in those situations. We do all these things and then we expect God or we're manipulating God to make sure that he gives us the things that we want in life. That's not love for God. A person can do all kinds of things for God and they can do all kinds of things to meet needs God they supposedly has or he has, but that does not mean a person loves God, which would mean they don't necessarily have this promise. The second way that we recognize we don't love God is that love for God is not loving the gifts that he gives us, like forgiveness, like justification, like acceptance, like eternal life. We can love all those things that he gives us, but that doesn't mean we love him. We can love the fact that we won't be punished for eternity. But again, that's not true love. That's just loving the things that he offers. You see, true love, a person who truly loves God, is someone who desires him for who he is. You don't have to do something for him, even though you will want to, because you love him. You don't just love the things that he offers and get upset when he doesn't give them to you in the way you want. You just love him for who he is. Yes, if you truly love him, you will love the gifts that he gives. I'm not saying that loving the gifts that he gives is wrong. I'm saying loving the gifts that he gives does not mean you love him. So this promise is a promise that's specific to a unique group of people. It's those who love God, who love him for who he is and are called according to his purpose. So it's not a promise that's intended for everyone. Second thing we see in this passage is right in the middle. Paul sandwiches the what does the promise mean right in the middle. He says, and we know that for those who love God, here's the promise, all things work together for good. Okay, so the second part, uh, if we go to the next verse, it should be the, is that middle? There we go. So here's the promise, uh, what the promise is sandwiched in the middle. All things work together for good. Okay, it's very important that we understand what this verse is saying. What it's really saying is that God is working all things, and we'll see what those all things are, together toward a good outcome, an ultimately good situation. Okay, so here's my second point to help us understand this passage. All things are not good, but instead are worked together for good by God. Very important we understand this. All things that happen are not good, but God in his sovereign power and his plan is able to work them together for good for that particular group of people that he talked about, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now, it's important to understand here uh, a very important dynamic that's often been misunderstood just in humanity and in Christianity as well, is the dynamic of, of mankind's free will and God's sovereignty, his power over all things. Oftentimes when we make mistakes in this realm, we run to one extreme or the other. And this is a passage that speaks about that very clearly. 
And it has a tension that I think the Bible has in here that God is both sovereign, meaning that he is overseeing everything and nothing happens outside of his sovereign plan. However, he's also given human beings a level of of freedom in their choice. We're not robots in the choices that we make. And when you swing to one extreme or the other, we fail to see who God is and how he's revealed himself. On one hand, uh, human beings and even psychologists can often say, hey, we're, just, we're free beings. We can choose to do whatever we want, and everything that happens in the future is determined by our choices. If you really believe that, you'd be so paranoid to get up in the morning because you'd be afraid that a choice you made that day could absolutely devastate your future as well as the future of so many other people. You could not live in a world that was solely determined by your choices. The other hand is, is also just as wrong, that God's this uh, dictatorial, predetermined person and we're just robots carrying out his plan, that, that he dictates everything that's going to happen and we become robots. That's the other extreme view. But the, the truth is that it's both and. God is absolutely sovereign, as the Bible reveals, and we are free to make choices within a certain realm. And God is able to work those two things together, and he's created a universe where both of those things can be true. Just because you and I can't understand it doesn't mean it's not true. In fact, there's many things just in the physical world that manifest this. As you, some of you know, I, my background is in science. That's where my original degree was in. And, and science manifests all kinds of examples like this. One of them is the properties of light. If you take a light beam, a light beam scientists have found, and they still can't explain this, that a light beam both has properties of a wave and of a particle at the exact same time. And depending on how you measure it, in some cases it manifests as properties of a particle, and like it's a little bead of light. In other cases, it manifests as the property of a wave. It does both and, two totally different things, and scientists have no idea how it does that. They still don't know, but they can totally explain, and I could show you experiments that show it has to be each of those. Quantum physics has revealed the same thing with subatomic particles, that particles are both in a location, but they also cover a region with some probability. So it's like a cloud inside an atom, not like a solar system. And in this cloud is the general place where any subatomic particle might be at any given point in time. But quantum physics says it doesn't just cover a straight path from one spot to another. It appears and disappears, and, and they just still can't explain that, that it both has a location, and yet it's covering a region of space. All kinds of examples in the physical world that scientists still can't explain, but they know are true. The same is true here. We have freedom of choice to a degree, but God is sovereign over all things that happen. And in this case, we see that working out here. So what does that mean? Let me give you some harmful results of an improper perspective. And you just put in your notes underneath that point, five, write down the number one through five. I'm gonna give you five key things that you have to understand about this truth that will help you. And these are harmful ways in which we use this passage or misunderstand it, okay? Five ways in which we can have a harmful perspective towards this truth. The first is this, don't skip past grieving, anger, or sorrow too fast. Don't skip past grieving, anger, or sorrow too fast. These aren't gonna come up on the screen, so you're actually gonna have to listen now. Okay, don't skip past grieving, anger, or sorrow too fast by stating this truth. You ever had that happen? You're lost a loved one in a horrible crash or some difficult situation comes along and someone coming along that just feels awkward, it's difficult to sometimes engage in a person's life in that situation and the first thing out of their mouth just out of an awkward silence is, you know, God works everything out for good. Yeah, we know that truth, but that does not mean that we don't grieve and experience a great loss at that moment. I mean, picture this. Picture Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying three times that God would remove this cup from him. And each time he came back, the disciples 
he found them sleeping. Imagine if they weren't sleeping and Peter got up and said, Jesus, come on, God works everything for your good. Imagine Jesus being beaten by the Roman soldiers, nailed to the cross, and Peter and John standing there going, as the nail's going through his hand, hey, Jesus, don't worry, God works everything out for good. Is that what you want to hear? Even though it's true, and yes, we need to remember that truth, God has made us as people who have emotions and experience loss that he made us with. And the Bible also says, weep with those who weep. Mourn with those who mourn. Empathize. Walk through the process with the person before we too quickly give them a Christian statement that really isn't what they need to hear at that moment. Are you with me on that? So just because this is true, it doesn't mean it's the first truth that we run to when we're walking through a situation with someone. Second thing we should avoid is don't call something that is bad, sinful, or evil good. Don't call something that is bad, sinful, or evil good because it resulted in an ultimate good. Let me say that again. Don't call something that is bad, sinful, or good or excuse me, bad, sinful, or evil, good, since it resulted in good by God's hand. See, this passage says that all things will work together for good, but it never says that all things are good. And here's what we often do. We might say something like this. You know, the horrible divorce that I went through with my wife uh, actually was a good thing because I met my new spouse and, and we're so much happier. You know, we, we start making statements like that. Or I was, I was put in jail due to a crime that I did. And in jail, someone shared the gospel with me and I trusted Christ. So it was a good thing that I went to jail and committed that crime. Those are some of the things that we often do. But God never does that. That's not what this passage says. He's not saying those sinful things that we did are good because they resulted in good. All he's doing is saying he can work something to result in a good, even though the event itself was bad or sinful or wrong. Are you with me on that? Okay, so don't, we don't want to do that. We don't want to call something that is bad, evil, or sinful good just because it resulted in good. Se- third thing is don't excuse irresponsible or foolish behavior simply because it eventually results in good from God's hand. Don't excuse sinful or irresponsible behavior because it eventually results in good. Say God bails us out of a foolish decision, so we think it it must have been a good one, right? Because God bailed us out. Maybe you went to prom this last few weekends and you insulted your girlfriend and she left you at prom, but you ended up leaving with a girl who was even cuter than she was. I'm, I'm just trying to think of something that's relevant to what's going on. That doesn't excuse your poor behavior of insulting someone. Don't ever excuse sin because God in his goodness works it towards something that ends up being good. That's not what this passage is talking about. The fourth thing is don't minimize consequences of sin and give in to it too easily. Don't minimize the consequences of sin and give in to it too easily. In a sense, saying the same thing. Oh, God's going to work it out for good. So we shouldn't say things like, you know, I I know I shouldn't be sexually active before marriage, but God will forgive it, and he'll work things out for good. That's not how he intends us to use this passage. In fact, have you ever talked to someone who's had a contracted an incurable STD? Ask them if they feel the same way about this promise. If they so flippantly think, I'm going to jump into sin because I know God will work it out for good. I'm not saying that he can't work that towards a good ending, but you'll think differently about the fact that this passage does not say anything about God removing all the consequences of our sin. Have you ever talked about someone who's experienced the incredible emotional damage of having multiple sexual relationships before they got married? Ask them if they would apply this passage this way. Ask a teenage girl who has a child and no husband if they think that flippantly about this verse. 
See, we should never use God's word as an excuse to minimize the harm that sin brings into our lives. We might say something, you know, I know abusing drugs and alcohol isn't good, but, but God will work it out for good. He'll excuse it. He'll forgive it. But have you ever talked to an ex-alcoholic or an addict about the harm and damage that that brought about in their lives? We should never minimize the effects of sin because of a promise in Scripture that says God will work things out for his good. Fifthly, and here's the last negative one I'm going to share, is don't blame God for difficulties. Don't blame God for difficulties using this passage. Rather, we should humbly accept the devastation of sin in a world that is broken and fallen. We shouldn't go to that extreme of God dictating everything and so he's forcing this. He's the one that made this happen to me. Instead, we need to recognize, yeah, he allows it because we live in a fallen, broken world that we as humans have brought that fallenness on. It's our choices that have allowed the presence of sin into the world and now we live with some of the devastation that goes along with it. So how should we see this properly? Here's two ways in which you can see it properly. So write the number one and two, and I'll give you a couple things you can think about here, and then we'll get to our last question. The first proper one is that the good that God works all things toward primarily applies to harm that, in, that is done to us by others or by life. The good that God works from these situations is primarily related to the harm that is done to us by others or life. That's what you're going to see in this passage. This passage isn't primarily intended to us, for us to say, hey, I'm going to be silly and foolish and do whatever I want and, and just know that God's going to work it all for good. That's not how this passage is written. It's written about harm or damage that's done to us by others or just by life circumstances in general. I want you to listen to this and see what the all things means in this passage because our verse says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. What are those all things? Well, watch as we go down to verse 31 through 39. Let's read through that and see where Paul elaborates on what these things are. And it'll come up on the screen as well. It says, what then shall we say to these things? What things? He's going to tell us. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And here's the things. Shall tribulation? Answer? No. Shall distress? Shall persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, he says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things, there it is again, present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, the good that God is working out for us is primarily in regards to the things that are done to us. It does also involve the things that we've done. He says in there, who will condemn no one can even condemn us for the things that we've done when we've been forgiven in Jesus Christ. But you see the primary application is for the harm that is done to us. So the second thing I just want to mention here is this, that yes, even God, God even works good from our sinful mistakes. He does do that. However, the good that he works towards from our sinful mistakes is never as good as what would have resulted from our obedience at that moment. We need to understand that. Yes, God does work even our sinful choices for good, but you're never better off sinning and letting God work it to his good than you are in obeying 
the first time around. The scriptures are filled with examples of that. So here's our last question. We've answered, who is this promise for? It's for believers, those who love God and are called according to his purpose. What is this promise? That God will work all things, all the difficulties, all the challenges, even the bad things, the sinful things, the harmful things that come into our lives. He will work them together for good. But it does not mean that they happened for a good reason. They could have happened for a very sinful, evil reason in our lives. But he will work them together to result in a good. Last thing is, how can this promise possibly be true? Have you ever pondered that? I think one question that a curious and thoughtful observer would ask is this. Why does God work all things together for good? Or even more so, how can he possibly work all things together for good? I mean, how could God be just and work and honor this promise? How can a rape, how can child abuse, how can murder be worked together for good and God call himself just? There's only one way. And it lands on one person. One person who made this promise possible. One person for whom this promise wasn't true until he earned it to be so. You see, when Jesus Christ came to earth, he came born of a virgin, born of the Holy Spirit. He came as the only sinless, perfect born child. And he was called to live a perfectly sinless life, absolutely perfect, so that he could earn a way for you and me. But if he would not have done that, if he would have slipped up at just one point, this promise would not have held true for him or for you and me. Because the only way a just God can work evil things for good is if he somehow justly judges those things that are evil and replaces them with something that was good. You see, God needed a perfect, holy sacrifice in order for him to make this promise available for you and me. Some perfect, sinless person had to walk through life and earn this promise And instead of getting what he deserved, taking what we deserved upon himself so that God could justly judge the evil and sin in this world in him and then give to you and me who don't deserve any good to come from our sinful brokenness. But yet it's offered anyways. You see, Jesus Christ became that good sacrifice And the only way God could work good from sin in this world was to judge the sin fully through a perfectly good sacrifice. That's what Jesus Christ did for you and for me. And that's why this promise says nothing for those who don't trust in Jesus Christ. And it says nothing about the fact that bad things are good because they result in good. Bad things are always seen as bad because God showed that in his son. He judged and he poured out his wrath upon his son because in his eyes, sin is always a bad thing, even if it results in a good. The only reason it could result in a good is was because of what he did in his own son, because his own son was willing to say, I will take the punishment for those who have sinned, and then I will give them the goodness of my perfect, sinless life. All they need to do is trust in me, to trust that I've done that for them. So how do we conclude? I think we conclude, first of all, by acknowledging that this myth is busted. All things do not happen for a good reason. 
Sometimes they happen for a very bad and evil reason. However, by the grace of God, even those bad things can be worked towards a good result when a person has trusted in Jesus Christ and the justice and the punishment of that bad thing is paid for in his life, in his death, and can be credited to us as good. So if you've never trusted in him, if you've never recognized what he gave you in the person of Jesus Christ, today is that day to do so. Accept him as your Savior. Accept him as your Lord. Recognize that he offers this promise to you through his perfect life and death. And in a practical way, as Christians, as believers, don't run too quickly to this truth when walking through a difficulty with others or yourself. I'm not saying you don't cling to it. I'm not saying you don't hang on to it. I'm saying be willing to weep with those who weep and grieve with those who grieve. In fact, if we didn't have this promise, we wouldn't have the freedom to properly grieve the way God gave us to grieve. It's okay to do that. All things are not good at that moment. But God will work them out towards good. Secondly is don't minimize or excuse sin because God can work it out for good. Don't ever think that doing the wrong thing will be okay because God will work it out. Always pursue obedience and its ultimate desired result. Let's pray. Father God, we're, we are thankful for this truth. It's a, a truth that should be at the foundation of who we are as your children. It's a truth that should be an anchor point for all of us. Lord, because apart from this truth, our lives would be incredibly shaky. Our security in you would be absolutely unknown. But this promise reveals to us the depth, the width, and the breadth of your love for us. And because of it, the security that we have in you. Lord, let that truth be something that motivates our hearts, that moves our hearts, that transforms our hearts to love you, God, more than we do. Not for what you give us, or not out of deeds that we must do or, or things that we feel we have to do for you, but for you yourself. And as you transform our heart, and as you stir our love for you, May we never use this promise as an excuse towards disobedience or to minimize the effects of sin in our lives. But instead, may it motivate us toward a holiness and a love for you. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you for these truths, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.